Hey everybody, welcome back to X's for Podcast. This is the Daily X, where we bring you news and discussion about your favorite Marvel comics, most notably the X-Men. I'm Nico, and you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at NicoAction. That's N-I-C-O-A-C-T-I-O-N. Today I'm here to introduce Hellions number 12. This was the Hellions installment of the Hellfire Gala, a whole lot of hell going on. And trust me, Nathan Drew, Josh, Blake, and Maddie bring the hell on this next segment. Hellions has been such an interesting ride, bringing together the best and worst of the X-Men at all times, but always in the most incredible package you can imagine. Zeb Wells has taken us on an incredible ride and I can't wait to see where it goes. If you guys like what you hear, don't forget to subscribe and like this video for more amazing X's for Podcast Daily X content. Hey everyone, the Hellfire Gala is in full swing now. We are covering Hellions 12 and I am Nathan. You can find me online at Dazzler AOA on Twitter and Instagram. Hey guys, I'm Maddie, and you can find me as always on Twitter at Basely Covetous and over on Instagram at the Basely Covetous Man. I'm Josh Wheel. You can find me on Twitter at Asleep at the Wheel, W E I L, and Asleep at the Wheel.com. And for the next two years as the progressive Democrat running for U.S. Senate in Florida, you can find me across social media at Wheel, the number four U.S. Senate, and Josh Wheel. Dot org. Hey, Andrew, you can find me online on Twitter and Instagram at Jucifer3, that's at D-R-E-W-S-I-P-H-E-R-3. And I'm Blake, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Blake's Buzz, and you can hit up my indie blog at Blake'sBuzz.com. And we hope everybody survives the experience, just like the buzz that Nightcrawler and Nanny has going on. I want to see that go on the whole event. Oh my god. Hellion is by Zeb Wells as the writer, Steven Segovia as the artist, David Curio as color artist, BC's Ariana Mayer as a letterer, Tom Moeller is on design for this. Before we get into the crux of the story, I gotta ask, this is such a magnificent event, and the costumes, which we'll get into in a minute, are amazing, but what are you guys thinking of art, specifically the cover art? Has everybody been just getting the standard, has everybody just been getting the standard cover, or has anybody else picked up all of their variant issue covers, just like me, which, oh my god, this is gonna cost me so much money in this event. <laughs> now, I got all the green carpet covers. I'm a sucker for connecting variants. <laughs> me too keep thinking of ways to display them once we get them all like like hanging them up at like the the top of the wall like you know, running like a, a stream of them mm. or something but yeah i just i keep thinking of like what am i gonna like 12 connecting variants is crazy and it, and it's all vertical right like it's there mm -hmm. it, that hasn't really yeah. been done before you know it's it's kind of a new connecting variant way like or it's been done before vertically but just not with 12 issues and then so yeah I, I got those myself i'm getting some of the cover a's like you know obviously like we were talking about in the green room the marauders cover a is gorgeous and i picked up the david nakayama virgin variants i like the magazine covers and i really wanted them but some of them like kind of blocked the art with the text and i was like it bummed me out and so i just ended up getting i spent like 120 bucks on the six virgin variants i was like oops oh those virgin variants though look amazing but yeah, yeah no i went to, they'll, they'll be I worth like the five dollars in a month probably they will, they will. <laughs> That's the problem with variants sometimes. You're like, ooh, okay, this is not going to be worth anything. But still, they're so beautiful. Like, I can't, I couldn't pass them up. I went with the magazine covers myself because I like the whole magazine's look deal of it. It makes it look like it's a tabloid rag and they're just going to, like, rag on everything that happens. Every time an event comes around, every time a crossover comes around, especially, I'm like, you know, I really should just see if there's anything that, like, catches my eye, that jumps out at me. But I always, I'm a little bit of a cynic and I'm like, yeah, you know, what if I don't really love it anymore? Anyhow, like I'm I'm a collector, but I'm not like that kind of collector. But I will say, if nothing else, the green carpet variants really jumped out at me. Variant collecting has gone by the wayside since I've made the move to digital. But man, these green carpet connecting variants are stellar. If nothing else, though, I would have maybe had Monet represent X Corp and found another stand-in for New Mutants. I think I haven't really seen, with the exception of uh, the first issue of X-Corp, I haven't seen any angels since X-Men Empire. And I was kind of like, why are you super important? Like, we get that you have money. Like, I know that you're like the, the, the event's resident himbo, but like... I don't know. Yeah, that's kind of like... Ugh what's the what's the point of angel period first off but you know what's the point of him being on the team but oh listen and i love shirtless with hair and pants and an oversized blazer as much as the next guy but like i'm just saying like be in some titles man be in, <laughs> be interesting that's all i'm asking <laughs> you are asking a lot to ask warren to be interesting that is okay, pretty that fair is big... I'll, i'm I'll just mind blown because i thought money did make you important and now i'm just wildly lost and confused <laughs> uh, as somebody with very little of it i I just try and convince myself it means nothing. <laughs> I should probably do that too. <laughs>
<laughs> True. <laughs> it really shouldn't be. If you are looking for the hottest place in Yunkai, look no further. This issue has it all. It has men missing their ex clones, party crashing, empath getting what he deserves, drunk nightcrawler riding on an egg, and nanny cock blocking Mr. Sinister. Before we get into all of that, this is a gala event. So we are introduced to the Hellions gala outfits in this issue. So let's real quick just kind of like look at those first. So first off, we've got Mr. Sinister's outfit. So is that hot or is it not, guys? Oh, Sinister's is hot. Sinister's is hot, period. I, I maybe expected more, but I feel like it's, it, if nothing else, it's a little understated for Sinister. And that's why I was a little surprising. Like, I would have maybe, like, sprung for something a little gaudier. But at the end of the day, like, taste is taste. You know, like, he wouldn't go in, you know, he, he's, he's always peacocking. But he's not going to go and dress like a literal peacock, you know? Yeah, to me, his regular outfit is kind of like a, like, it could have fit in with the gala. So, and this one is is pretty similar to it, except it just has, like, the cape going into the front. My kind of thing, I was thinking about this, is Sinister should get into, like, headpieces next. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. The big thing with Sinister, I think, when we're talking about his aesthetic, has to come from one of the great revelations of this issue, which is that Sinister is Sinister sexual. <laughs> and so Sinister is going to look like exactly what he wants to bang. So Sinister is as beautiful as Sinister needs Sinister to be. <laughs> he really was revealed to be Sinister sexual, was he? I was kind of like, oh, alrighty then. That's why he likes those clones. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so we kind of covered Sinisters personally. I think I'm surprised he didn't go with the cape because how many issues did we hear him complain about his cape and the lack of the cape? But so then we've got Havoc's insanely geometrical, like I don't even know what's going on with it. We've got Havoc's outfit. What do you guys think of Havoc's outfit? It was like the uh, futuristic Hugh Hefner smoking jacket thing. Yeah, like that oh my had God, like, it's it, it, like and the, it has like these like orbiting multiple collars like i don't really know what they are but like yeah it, i mean it's just it's it's wacky but it's cool it's weird seeing him like because his normal costume is so minimal you know like he's he's in a jumpsuit he is peacocking it i think you know and it, just seeing him all like just out there like that it's just it was it was kind of kind of jarring but in a good way not in a bad way just like whoa like the crowning touch on havoc's costume is the fact that he didn't brush <laughs> his hair it's what, because the fact that he's got this messy hair on top makes him look like he has this beautiful costume he's in, but he's still a dumbass that doesn't belong. Like, he's still a dumbass that doesn't know what he's supposed to be doing. We see him a lot with, like, that his, like, head thing on, so we don't really get to see his, like, hair and most of his face a lot. So it's just kind of like we're actually seeing it now out of his costume. I mean, there there are no ugly summers, right? So, I mean, he's a, no. he's a good, he's oh, a good no. looking... He's a good looking dude. But, yeah, the, the disheveled hair is, is funny. I didn't even think about that because he's just, like... His, uh... The, the gaze that, that falls upon him is, is, like, the orbit... The orbit trail collars and stuff. Like, you don't really look at his... I I didn't even notice his hair. I thought you the said gaze. the gaze. The, like the, the gaze. gaze. The, <laughs> yeah, no. The G-A-Z-E, fellas. Like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, I'm just got, now I'm imagining a whole gaggle of gays. <laughs> following Alex to somewhere around, I, I might do that too. But I, I don't know if I could really stand listening to hear him talk about Maddie all the time, even though she's fabulous, but still. I was all about that because for months and months and months and months, I've been begging for this, is this, this clone drama to come forth. And I did not expect that in the opening three issues of the Gala crossover. I was like, whoa, <laughs> shit, yes, do it. Let's fight fight get in the argument like let's get drunk and talk about clones like if that's all that happens in the hellfire gala i'm good <laughs> agreed all right so then the other big look we get from the hellions team out of this book is the amazing cannons look to quote john gray crow oh that's a nice dress what are you guys thinking about this beautiful plunging neckline with the pink kind of psychic krakoan flowers oh i i dig it the psychic flowers were a gorgeous touch. And I love that Betsy had them as well around oh, yeah. her head. Absolutely. That it was something that they both shared, but in their own unique way. Josh hit it right on the head. Like, I think it was, uh, it was really beautiful. It was really understated in the best way. I think it was really in line with her character. I, if nothing else, 
the these three looks that we're talking about remind me they they each have an equal and opposite comparison somewhere else in the gala in a way and if you'd follow me for a second i would say i compare sinister and colossus's look because when i originally saw colossus's look for the gala my assumption was oh that's sinister he just cut his hair because it it looked so perfectly like the goth dream daddy that sinister could be if he were just a little bit cooler so for me colossus takes the cake there Havoc beats out Cyclops, just if we're going to compare Summers to Summers, I think Cyclops is a little bit gaudy and on the nose, whereas I think Havoc's is a little bit like between the concentric circles, the muted earth tones, and the banded shoulders that resemble his helmet. Absolutely love it. Talking about Quanin, I think, and uh, this is me doing my best Joan Rivers for everybody, just in case nobody knew. I'm just not going to do a vocal impression because, you know, God rest her. But... I, I think that if you compare Quanin and Betsy's, I think that's a pretty split tie for me. And I think it's because they both are pretty, pretty iconically who the characters are trying to be in the current age. I, I was going to do it. I quote uh, Joan Rivers and be like, ah, who is those outfits? But I actually like these outfits. So, um, but I didn't get the chance. Maybe if I see Dazzlers on panel sometime, I'll be like, ah. Okay, Get, I know we're only I know we're supposed to stay on topic, but did anyone see Dazzler in, in the three? We got a brief cameo of Dazzler, like as a bus <laughs> coming through the portal. Yeah, we did. Nathan, you, I'm so sorry, man. You don't even you don't even get Dazzler in the crossover. Like, there's. I know, I know. I want. What did she do to Jonathan Hickman? That's what we need to find out. We need to X's for podcast needs to go on a, a mission of discovery to, to find out <laughs> what Sabretooth and Dazzler did to Jonathan Hickman. In his <laughs> that made him cast them out for this whole rebranding of the X saga. But she's kind of been in it. Like she's always just been in the background though. Like you just see her like like as like another person. You know, I tweeted this a couple days ago. Like if you're if you're not a Dazzler fan, are you actually an X-Men fan? Because everybody likes Dazzler. <laughs> right. <laughs> they should, they better. Uh no, it's it's crazy. I'm I'm glad that there's a amazing amount of people that are being brought in, brought to the forefront. This whole book of people that we're covering right now is a team of people who I would have never expected to see in comics. Havoc, sure. Cannon, sure. But I would not have expected to see Nanny and love Nanny if you told me before Hellions came out that I was going to love Nanny. I think I'm well on record on Twitter going, groan, ugh, Nanny. I, I am absolutely amazed at this crew. So now it's pretty clear to me why the majority of the Hellions didn't score an invite and had to crash the party. Now, my question is to you guys, would you have all invited them? Hell no. Absolutely not. And I feel like it's just because, if nothing else, the human inclusion in this matter kind of complicates things. I think Havoc hit it on the head when he said, you know, you guys might have been invited had you not killed so many parents. And that was specifically a nod to, to Orphan Maker, but realistically, Nanny is viscerally terrifying, absolutely horrifying with zero social grace. And now the rock and edge that she has due to her resurrection, I mean, who would have expected her to tie one on so heavily? Uh, the only one that I would almost consider, and it's just because he's odd, uh, we're just going to call a spade a spade. Grey Crow should have gotten an invitation because Grey Crow cleans up nicely, or at least I imagine Grey Crow would clean up nicely. But when you used to go by Scalp Hunter, it's a little hard to redeem that in the eyes of like the geopolitical landscape of the gala. So like, I get it, I think. But then again, having Sinister around is, I mean, he's social dynamite himself. You know, he asks Captain America and Iron Man, uh, which one is which? I don't own a TV. Like that's just <laughs> purposefully obstinate, bordering on ignorance. Like, you don't have a place here either, my dude. So, like, I guess I started with a strong no, I wouldn't have invited them. But I guess, like, I would have just uninvited Sinister because I kind of fucking hate Sinister. I'm just, like, person yeah. to person. All right. And then the rest of you guys, would you guys have, would you guys have invited the Hellions? Yes. Yes. Ah. I, I, I mean, I just love a good clusterfuck. I mean, I do. I And I, <laughs> I, I think they deserve it, man. That... That team, if Sinister gets to go, that whole team should get to go. Like Sinister's put those guys through the ringer, and th they deserved a, a night off with a with an open bar and and to just kind of you know chill. But I I mean I guess you know as as we see like having them there isn't 
isn't the best move but they were able to clean that up pretty quickly i loved that scene by the way with magic when they're like uh magic and she's like let me finish my drink one second and then portals them away (laughs) the a lot of the high points of this issue would not have happened if the if they wouldn't have crashed the party so i mean technically the hellions made the gala better the first two issues of the galas we got high stakes political drama and we got none of the soapy stuff that we are getting in this issue I, I love that they're here, and I'm glad that they crashed the party. Now to the action in the main event. There is so much that happens here. Let's start with this issue is a book about relationships. From Havoc, still going around, trying to find out about Maddie, complaining to, of all people, Lorna, his ex fiance We've got Wild Child to counter with Aurora, which I'm so glad they brought up that x Factor romance again, which has sort of been forgotten. And we've got the further buildup of the flirtationship between Quanin and Grey Crow. This issue has more relationship drama than a soap opera. Like the telepathic sands through a CR hourglass, these are the days of Krakoa. So guys, let's dish. What was your favorite relationship-related moment of the I'm still dying about days of Krakoa. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with Blake. It was the whole Havoc and Madeline kind of like Havoc trying to find out what's not even necessarily trying to get her back, but just reasons, like just like trying to understand the situation. To me, that's kind of like one of the most interesting threads that's going through Hawk's Pox right now. I liked how Lorna kind of kind of jumped into that scene too, and, and he was like, you know, it's just because like all clones, like <laughs> he like got <laughs> real, he got real awkward with it. But yeah, I didn't even really think of that till till Nathan brought it up. Like, yeah, there was a lot of really great like romantic bits in this like initially when i read it i was like oh this is like maybe like a misdirection like this is the issue that makes us laugh you know after we've read marauders after we've read horse which is you know in the reading order and in the back matter you know like this was very light-hearted and and chill and and less less menacing than the the first two issues really i was like man i wonder what's going to happen next week but yeah like it, it is very it's very interesting like all these all these little relationships that are blossoming and we're focused on and just in just 23 pages like and they were really great moments and they weren't overbearing and they made sense and that was really that was really smart writing and and um and like good uh like emotional feedback from the artists and stuff like it was all handled really well i didn't really connect those dots till just now so i've been on record in a lot of our previous episodes of wanting to see some callback with a lot of these characters to things from yeah, the old x factor run you know like a year ago a year and a half ago i did a, a deep dive going through all 149 issues and so you know i was super excited when I saw Rhapsody show up in the first issue of this in Marauders and then when we finally got our Kyle and Aurora moment that I've been waiting for since both of them have now kind of come back out of 20 years of nowhere to you know be big players in team books again in the last year so I was personally super excited for uh, the Kyle Aurora moment and the inevitable awkward Kyle uh, Deken moment but I think the best written and the best written throughout this series has been Conan and John Gray Crow they're definitely going to be doing some horizontal dancing after the fireworks tonight but they had some of the best moments the way that they're drawn together the way that i want to say zeb wells does more with less you know not a lot of dialogue you know but just the little right thing and then some kind of quieter moments with them together just being comfortable with each other and one of the top lines of this issue i think was conan talking about sharing with him about how far she's come in her relationship with betsy killing her every day in a vivid dream for every day for 30 years in a vivid dream doesn't hurt that is one of the things i specifically wanted to pivot to is that relationship update now we've seen a lot of it going on through excalibur and through hellions and but the relationship update between canon and betsy is something that if you look back from the start of the dawn of x they could barely look at each other now they're now they're greeting each other in excalibur and conan basically saved betsy's life so i want to know what do you guys think about the new paradigm of the relationship um and then i think betsy and conan's uh relationship was really you know it was nice to see an addendum put on it in the way of a quick encounter at the gala because I was a little bit concerned that after the arc that we came out of just before this two-part arcade arc where we sort of really wrapped that up nicely where Quanin was the one to rescue Betsy 
in, excuse me, that might have been in the pages of Excalibur, the, the interplay is, is outstanding between these titles, as limited as it, as it is. But suffice to say, having seen it resolved so neatly in Excalibur left me hoping that we would see it touched upon in Hellions. And I think it was just the right kiss and go. I think it was just the appropriate amount of recognition without having to harp on the moment and create this this lingering dissonance in it. And before I toss it to anybody else, I just wanted to pause it since uh, now we're back to talking about the melodrama of it all. Were this not Days of Prokoa, it might also be Days of Our Infinite Lives or... <gasps> Or that's so good. <laughs> that was good. That's that was so really good. good. Days of Our that Infinite Lives or The Young and the Resurrected. Um, oh, yeah. The Young and the Resurrected, it is. The, the, joy, the joy of having five people in a room is that I get to listen to you all. And in the breaths, I'm just like, think of something funny. Think of something funny. <laughs> <laughs> but I am curious. All right. Well, let's, let's just go around Robin. Uh, Blake, what did, did you think? I I dug it. I'm always really happy when the books connect. I know they can't do it all the time, but it just makes me feel like, oh, see, this is why you buy every single X issue and sometimes variants. And so, like, you know, it, it's an investment, right? And so I really do like the little moments where uh, the, the, the titles cross over with each other. And then, of course, you know, these big moments like, you know, Sword and the Gala. Yeah, I, I dug it. it. It's such an interesting mechanic. Their, their whole, you know, backstory and history and you know these two people that 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 share like a, have a psychic and biological bond that like no two people have really like it, it's it's so unique and interesting and complex and does bring a lot of drama with it so there's there's a lot of like you know emotional violence kind of in, in their backstories due to how, you know who and what they are so yeah the the fact that they're like ex- exist comfortably i think is good i think it's good for the x world I'm, I'm hoping we have like good future instances and and interactions with them because of it like you know it's they're they're two cool characters and they they ocu- when they occupy the same panel it's it's interesting and and also like a rise in tension it's like whoa like what's gonna happen you know i like i am on the exact same page i freaking love it when like the issues cross over like between this x and then excalibur the one thing too that i really like is that betsy and conan they still don't like each other like they're still not friends or anything but they can like work together if they have to which i think that's like an important thing to do with people just in general you know like you're not gonna like every single person that you come across but you know maybe have like a bad rapport with them but just to like work it out do the job at hand maybe just like give them a wave and keep going you know that's like it (laughs) and that's fine you know like just build those boundaries yeah i mean i i like what zeb wells is doing here one of the things though is that i feel that this book is more a series of kind of like one-liners or like funny interesting things stitched together than it really is an extended drama and I think my biggest disappointment about this, which has nothing to do with, well, maybe it does. I don't, I don't know who was involved in the decision making, but might not even be a knock on Zeb Wells. It's just that this is our second big crossover in a row where the Hellions feel like they're a stitched in backup story to the gala. That they're not actually moving the gala story, that they're a gala chapter, but not moving the gala forward. Much like they were an X of Swords chapter, not moving X of Swords forward. I would have much rather seen them try to give the Hellions a job or have something to do or, you know, make what tied what happened here tie into something that was going on in one of the other books. You know, the way that the first two chapters of Marauders and X-Force gave us these threads and threats moving forward that are going to be explored more in the later chapters. This one really felt like it just ended with Nanny puking in her egg suit and, you know, the rest of the team watching Psychic Fireworks. (laughs) And so the fact that, you know, we have a bunch of these characters that we are invested in and their involvement in the gala feels like it's ending in chapter three made it feel a little sparse. I would have liked them to feel more integral or tied in. Because it's also not the first time. Like, it's it's the same thing they did in Exorcist. You know, I, I definitely hadn't looked at it that way. But in reading it, something felt a little bit familiar to me. And you're absolutely right, Josh. It really is just that their inclusion is tangential at best. I would just say, as somebody who works in uh, food, beverage, and hospitality for a career, I know firsthand that when you have a large 
um, unruly event to manage with limited hands on deck to help. You don't take your problem staff and move them up to floor waiters. You let them smoke pot and valet cars. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I think that it it would have surprised me if the Hellions were given enough trust to have an integral role in the gala itself. I totally understand the impetus for wanting them to feel more included because it did feel a little, you know, Frankenstein stitched together. But if nothing else, I'm glad it was a crashing event and not a working event because there's only so interesting as you can make. In my in my opinion, Zeb Wells is the professional and he is here to prove me wrong. That's literally what he works for. He wakes up every morning. He's like, I have to prove that one guy from that podcast wrong. And that guy's <laughs> me. Um, and it's totally cool. We have a give and take relationship. But having said that, I, I think that this was, if it's going to be a one-off, it's going to be a one and done inclusion for them, then okay. I admittedly don't have the read order in front of me. I don't see how many more times Hellions will grace these pages of the gala. Uh, uh, it's only one. On. It's only one for each issue. It's one for yeah. each issue, right? Yeah, well, it's one for every, so one for every one, yeah. in that case, I feel a little bit better about this than 10 of swords where we had two or three issues of, nope, we're still meandering through other world. Oh yeah, that, that uh, their inclusion in Ten of Swords was like you guys have all mentioned. It was maybe a fun little interlude, but it definitely served no purpose. It served no purpose at all, except for the fact that we did get to see Nanny on a horse, which like kind of made the whole event for me. Uh, I hate how wonderful she is. When so when when this series was announced, I was one of those idiots that was like, "This is trash." Like this, oh, like, me too. That that cover they put, I was like, why are they? Why is Psylocke my one of my favorite characters? Like leading this team of, of douchebags. Like I, I, I was like, I was so mad. And then yeah, I was, I was so wrong. You know, this ended up being for me one of my favorite X books. We're what twelve issues in, and it's it's been twelve wonderful issues. But I, I do agree that like in Ten of Swords, they were kind of like you know an, an add on. But that's why I really liked this issue because I felt like it was Zeb being like, you know what, you didn't invite me to this party, but I'm gonna crash it. And like he did, he crashed this, he crashed this gala party in with his with his one tie in issue, and it was. It's glorious. Uh, I mean, I just like anytime the Hellions are involved, I'm I know I'm looking for a good time. So this issue had this issue had the drama. Now we're getting to the booze. Any good party has got an open bar. And this party definitely has a big open bar. So we go from sinister. Is he flirting with Captain America and Tony Stark? I don't know. Drunkenly doing that too. So we we've got Nightcrawler already drunk as the night starts, and he comes in and he rides Nanny around the party. So what was your guys' favorite booze induced moment? Moment. definitely nanny uh she had two for me she had when when sinister's like are we going to be this talkative all night and she says we are like oh man that was yes. such a wonderful panel and then the the icy reply from him like that's also like you know vi the visual icy dialogue bubble like was so great but also her like her blowhole that she basically yes! just pours the champagne into like like and she's two fist and drinks the whole issue long i was like oh man she she commands like she has so much agency and commands attention and it shocks me every time like because i i was totally unfamiliar with her character before hellions and um and just like how on my radar she is now and just like every time i see her in panel i know something crazy is gonna happen and yeah this i loved her in this issue and yes night <laughs> drunk drunk nightcrawler was awesome Se segovia gets mad props for making nanny so interesting without even being able to use facial expressions but the top moment for me was her smashing a champagne yes, glass. Yes, that was great. I like how they tell her, too. They're like, uh, trying to murder another mutant in front of the humans is not the way to go. Like, <laughs> like, oh, God, but that moment was so good. She's just like, well, yeah. it's on. Smash. <laughs> go time, motherfucker. Yeah, I, I'm definitely one of those people when I saw that Nanny and Orphan Baker were going to be on the Hellions, I was like, really, what the fuck? Those guys were like so fucking stupid and lame and X Factor way back when. And I was like, eh, really? But oh my God, I fucking love them. And, I, and I'm so glad we got them. I, I want to say the two Nightcrawler cameos just because they were a little ridiculous. Um, just completely out of character for Nightcrawler, in my opinion. Although like 
and no disrespect here because I'm obviously painting in broad strokes, but a lot of repressed um, religious types tend to not know how to moderate their alcohol intake. And it's fine. It's just a thing that you notice as a as a longtime bartender. Um, sometimes people with a lot of like weird repression um, tend to tend to hit that bottle hard. But aside from that, I I think if I had to pick a favorite moment, it was bananas. Bananas. <laughs> if not bananas, it was definitely drunken fireworks, telepathic fireworks. Ooh. Those damn fireworks, man. I want to know what they saw. I will know. I'm Sorry, like, I know we'll, we we're probably going to talk about that later. Sorry. But. <laughs> no, you're good. I'm like, why didn't we get to see him? Uh, kind of, I liked how Orphan Maker wasn't really, he's not drunk, but he was drunk. Like, Empath made him drunk. So the whole time he's pretending to be drunk. Not pretending, though. He, like, is, but isn't. <laughs> because <gasps> he's a kid. <laughs> Real quick, one bonus drunken. I really, really, really liked the textual pages. Oh, uh, yes. The psychic, oh, my God. The psychic dialogue with, between the cuckoos. Like, they're, like, you know, they're, they're like, supervising the party and, and the whole deal, though. And when Phoebe changes, on the, she's, they're, like, where's Phoebe? She's, like, I'm changing. <laughs> like <laughs> I, I li- like those were like cr- crazy laugh. I, I'm not like I usually like the textual pages. I liked that for the first time in 12 issues, Empath wasn't a cunt, and that we got to see some more former Hellions. I love Taro and Cat's Eye. I did love seeing that moment where Taro and Cat's Eye got their revenge, though, for making him making him fight. That was my favorite. Maybe me probably just because I'm probably the only Cat's Eye stand out there. So. I don't know. Like, I don't think anybody else loves that goofy purple cat like I do. That actually is a nice segue to the last big thing I wanted to... I want Cat's Eye and Rain to be able to run around Krakoa together. <gasps> I really do want them to be able to run around Krakoa together. The last thing I really want us to cover is the action that we saw. And, and there's one thing at the very end, the last page reveal that we'll get to at the last thing that we'll talk about. What drama action sequence did you guys like the best? I don't know. For me... I have to say, I know the action scene that I really loved the most was the Nanny Sinister drama. See, I love anytime I see Nanny take Sinister down a peg. Obviously, we had the Wild Child the Kin battle that's brewing from this and a lot of other drama. And the way that Quanin got the Hellions into the event in the first place by psychically blackmailing Quentin Choir. What was your guys' favorite moment? I think it was the quiet Grey Crow moment. Like, I love, I did just love, because I was personally satisfied with getting a Kyle Aurora moment. And then having it paired with Grey Crow and Quanin sitting there having their quiet moment at the bar. And he's just like, I got it. And he goes over and starts that fight because it's him jumping on Kyle to keep him from fighting to Ken. But I love the quiet alongside of like Kyle getting loud but that, you know, led to that big fight. And, you know, it, it brought a lot of things together. When you guys were talking about earlier about, you know, whether Grey Crow should have been invited, I, there's only three what you could really call responsible adult on the Hellion. You know, that's if you want to call Sinister a responsible adult. We got Sinister, Conan, and Grey Crow. So one of them has to stay home and watch the kid, um, which is why I think Grey Crow didn't get invited. But the fact that he got to be there with Quan and, and and then the role that he played, I mean, he he was the best for me in this. And, and I loved the way he jumped into that Kyle the Ken moment as, you know, he, he's not scalp puncher anymore. He's like sexy older brother type now. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay, you know what? As innocuous as this sounds, I would really just go with one singular panel. It was roulette and cat's eye just kicking the shit out of empath just like he deserved just like he deserved frankly i've been waiting and there's something about having watched empath die multiple times in the run of hellions that like in a quentin choir-esque way is starting to desensitize me to the idea of it but watching him just get a good old ass kicking like a good old-fashioned ass kicking from some former teammates that was just Ooh. I love that. I really liked the Decan Wild Child Aurora kind of interplay between them. I thought that one was really interesting, fun, just because, like, you know, it was, again, going on past experiences and stuff. And just like, you know, we're getting a little bit more into Wild Child's kind of Arakan personality a little bit more, kind of. He's a little bit of a new character, kind of, in a way. So, because he's been progressed, evolved, that he seems like a new character. So, it's kind of like getting to, getting reacquainted 
acquainted with him. My favorite moment was the was Havoc talking to uh, Magneto about about the clones. Just because, like I said, I I've been waiting for this. You know, we've we've had Gabby voice her her opinions on the matter in in, in past issues and the beginning of Hellions. We saw we we saw Havoc question the the council's decision on clones. It's been this lingering tension that hasn't really been addressed, and I was not expecting it in the opening chapters of the gala and that really took me by surprise i really really hope i mean we're gonna get repercussions from it someday we we have to they keep bringing it up but i just i want it so bad i want i want madeline back and and i want to know gabby's safe if if anything ever happens to her and so yeah it was it was cool to have that brought up and then like i said i really like i really liked magneto's daughter coming in at at that awkward moment because you know like her her and havoc have that kind of on again off again deal anyway and then so for for him to be like you know it wasn't like it's not like i want her back it's just like all clones right like i don't know it's just like really awkward and funny and this whole issue is just awkward and funny and band of misfits and everything they bring to this new birth of x-men is is really wonderful and this issue showcased like it showcased it perfectly as to why this is one of the best X books out there. I loved every single second of the awkward drama, like you were talking about. The Lorna and Havoc scenes were amazing. Just, just the idea of this, this longtime ex girlfriend, his ex fiance, Havoc is sitting there complaining about not having Madeline Pryor. It's just, it's so Havoc is so such a fucking himbo, and I love him for it. So after the Hellions are kicked out of the party, they just crashed. They get to witness the telepath fireworks through some magic from Quanin, and we also get the return of the sinister from Araco. Is that who that is? Where were you guys when you saw that last panel and the fireworks, which was so fun too, even though we didn't get to see them? I did not put together that that was Araco sinister. I was trying to figure out like when Nanny had slashed him with a broken champagne glass across the forehead. That lobotomy Araco sinister coming back is very, very interesting. You just blew my my mind galaxy brain it's so funny because it wasn't until you mentioned that that was the sinister from other world from morocco that it clicked for me i was like what happened like what did we miss at the gala that his head's cut open like is that from nanny but then i looked back at panels like before that realized that we didn't see any sort of act of violence like that very confusing in that regard so so frankly my thoughts are just now developing on the matter because I just sort of figured it out. You know what I mean? Damn, thanks for helping me put that together. I guess I guess we'll pivot to someone else who knew what was going on. <laughs> it's it's fine. I also did not get it until I saw someone reviewing the video and they said it. Yeah, I think it could have been made a little bit more clear, but I'm pretty sure the solicits for the next issue of Hellions is going to go into like Locust Vile and all that stuff. Kind of interesting to see where that goes. Ah, good. Yes. Harley and carrying uh sort of spliced sinister towards the end like if you guys ever saw what happened to Celine where before she made Amanda Septon of all people rescue her from that machine where she was just unraveling and slicing herself up so it's crazy and he had the clone on Krakoa hidden away just in case he didn't come back so this is going to be crazy to see okay. this battle going on um i don't know do we think nanny do we think nanny is going to take sides in the sinister war that's going to probably come <laughs> I kind of would like to see her take down just the winner, the winner. Like, it's a hard-fought battle. You know, we've got one Sinister barely holding on, and then Nanny comes and does whatever Nanny does. Do we know, like, what are Nanny's mutant powers? Is she, like, a low-level telepath? Is that what she's supposed to be, or...? I don't even know. I don't know that we've actually seen her use her powers. She's got the two suits. There's the one, there's, like, the nurturing suit and the battle suit, right? We saw that a while back. Yes. Yeah, she's, she's got the suit. She was a scientist before, and we know she's a older lady but it's oh it does say that her mutant power is a type of low-level telepathy and mind control which she enhances by projecting a chemical pixie dust at her victim victims so okay so she's kind of like i was gonna say she's kind of like a pixie off brand knockoff but a nanny came first so i guess that makes pixie a nanny knockoff i'm not sure how i feel about that i i would just like to address the fireworks and how massively disappointed i was so i read hellions first right because i knew we were recording and i wanted to like get that out of the way and then i you know jotted down some notes and then i was like i probably read because marauders was the red issue right and so like then i read marauders and and x-force and i was like 
because I, I was like, well, surely I guess in I guess in Marauders it's red, so we'll get to see the fireworks there. And then I read Marauders, and I was like, well, there's no fucking fireworks. And then I read X Force, and I was like, there's no fucking fireworks. And I was like, what are the fireworks? And the fireworks instill tension, like. The mutants really like it, but everyone leaving the gala has some really intense opinions of things that, that they're like, there's that interaction with Steve and Scott. And then there's the interaction and these are in the other issues I know, but like there's the interaction with the Brazil ambassador and, and Emma. And like, there's some like big words that are said after people see these fireworks. And I really wonder like why they didn't let us see them initially and how, and then it also makes me wonder about the structuring of the following. We've got nine, more issues to go in this crossover we see the guests arrive and the guests leave in these three issues so i kind of wonder how like the rest is going to be structured is it going to be the aftermath of the gala is it going to be you know side stories of the gala like i'm, I'm real interested in the, in the upcoming weeks of uh x books to see how this event is structured and how it plays out the way i'm kind of getting it is that every single issue is is the entirety of the gala so the next book is going to start from the very beginning of the gala and it's going to it's going to fit in those whole that marauders or like hellions missed you know nightcrawler is drunk in this a lot so in way of x we're gonna like go deeper into that why he's so drunk and what happened i'm, I'm down with that too i was i'm also thinking that maybe they're holding the fireworks for uh world of x or whatever or whatever the, the new kind of giant size issue is I, i'm hope i'm thinking that's probably where we're gonna get the fireworks or they're gonna make us wait till the end because i want it now so they're gonna make me wait a month <laughs> <laughs> they would just to talk to you also we've got we know there's some big you know there's some big events that are going to happen in the gala because we know we know the x-men are going to totally get revealed we know that something's going to go on with magneto that's going to cause a trial we know all of these crazy things that are going on hey guys if you like that cut from x's for podcast you'll be sure to like some of our other materials so don't forget to like subscribe and check out these other amazing videos here at x's for podcast